there, future nurse. Now, I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I bet you'll like this video. And if you do, be sure to head to simplenursing.com forward slash YouTube for way more content than you can get here. And you can sign up for free. Now for fluid volume balance. In this video, we're going to be going over pathophysiology of body fluids, key terms for fluid physiology, as well as fluid volume overload and deficit. And also, finally, the tonicity of fluids, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic solutions. So let's play the first segment right now. Now, the human body is made up of 60 to 70% fluid. And as you grow older, H2O gradually decreases from birth to old age, usually because of muscle mass, which holds water and gradually decreases with age. This is why our infants and elderly patients are most at risk for fluid imbalances. Now guys, just think of your sweet grandmother here. Our elderly populations are most at risk for fluid imbalances like fluid volume overload. Now due to heart failure or broken kidneys, something called renal failure, or on the other side of the coin, dehydration from not drinking enough water or usually because they're not thirsty or forget. Now, what are the top three factors that mostly influence fluids? Number one, we have muscle. Number two is body fat. And three is gender. So starting with muscle, muscle holds on to water. Guys, please write that down. That's a huge test tip. But also skin and blood contain the highest amounts of water in the body. So technically, obese patients have less fluid than those who are thin because fat cells repel water kind of like how oil floats on the top of water. Now, I used to be a personal trainer for a long time, about eight years, and I always used to think obese people had more water retention because I thought that's what made them bloated. But it's actually the opposite. Obese people have less total body water than a lean person. For example, if we had two patients here at the exact same weight, both weighing, let's say, 200 pounds. That one patient who's 200 pounds of muscle and another patient who's 200 pounds of fat. Well, the obese patient would be most at risk for fluid imbalances like dehydration because less lean muscle mass and more fatty adipose tissue. So it's easier to understand why, in general, younger people have higher percentage of body fluids than older people. It's mainly the muscle mass. Now, also, since men have proportionally more lean muscle mass than adipose tissues, aka body fat, in general, men retain more fluids than women. Now, body fluid is located in two main areas. Fluid inside the cell called the ICF, the intracellular fluid, and fluid outside the cell called the ECF, the extracellular fluid. So let's start with the ICF, intracellular fluid. So the fluid inside the cell. Our key electrolyte is potassium, who I call king potassium. He's the king of action and contraction in your muscles. Now, he's the most abundant electrolyte inside the cell because of the fancy sodium-potassium pump. So please just remember that potassium is pulled outside the cell to inside the cell. Now, as much as two-thirds of all fluid in the body are intracellular inside the cell, but mainly in the skeletal muscle cells. Dang, that's like 75% of fluids inside the cell. And that's exactly right. This is where our electrolytes are floating to. Remember those electrolytes that light up the body with the electric energy? So obviously it makes sense that electrolyte imbalances causes so much muscle problems. Now switching gears here, let's change to the fluid outside the cell in the ECF, the extracellular fluid. This is the fluid inside the blood vessels, the skin tissues, and even the spinal cord fluid called CSF. It accounts for only one-third of body fluids. Now, technically speaking, six liters of blood that are circulating around our circulatory system, aka in the vascular spaces, and 11 to 12 liters in the interstitial fluids, as well as one liter in the transcellular space, or basically the fluid in between our cells. Like our CSF, our cerebral spinal fluid around your brain and spinal cord, your pericardial fluid, all that fluid around your heart muscle, your synovial fluid, your joint fluid, your intraocular fluid, your eye fluid, your pleural fluids, known as your lung fluids, as well as your digestive secretions, your intestinal fluids. Now, fluids are gained and lost via a few main organs. Mainly, number one is the kidneys, which I call the washing machines. Number two is the skin. Then we have the lungs. And then lastly is our Mr. G.I. Joe himself, the G.I. track. Now, starting with your kidneys, the washing machines of the blood also serve as the doors to your body. 
that let fluid out of the body and into the body. Now, normal daily urine output is one to two liters in a normal healthy adult. Now, technically speaking, one ml of urine per kilogram of body weight per hour for all age groups. Now, that's just really fancy words for about 240 mLs of urine in three hours. Basically, eight ounces or one cup of urine in three hours. Now, the minimum amount of urine per day that is needed to excrete toxins and waste is between 400 to 600 mLs. So guys, if your patient is not having urine output for at least 240 mLs in three hours, or 480 mLs in six hours, or basically a half a liter halfway through your nursing shift, well guys, there's a huge problem. Your patient should be excreting almost about a liter through a 12 hour shift. Now if your patient's not excreting this much, well then something's probably wrong with your patient's kidneys. So your patient's probably gonna have a bunch of toxic waste inside the body and not in the potty. Now a little side note here, this is why INOs, input and output recording, is so vitally important. Because it tells us early on if your patient has a kidney problem or not. Rather than waiting around 24 hours for all those lab reports every day to come to see if your kidney labs are high. Technically speaking, we can look at the BUN and creatinine levels to see if the kidneys are actually involved. But a quick side note to the side notes, if both BUN and creatinine are high, it's usually an indication of renal failure problems. But guys, if only BUN is high, it's usually a dehydration problem. Because I call this the burn bun syndrome. Kind of like if you went out sun tanning too long and got your buns burnt. So if you have high bun, it basically means your patient is dry. Next, we have the less important GI tract. 100 to 200 mLs daily is normal, even though approximately 8 liters of fluid is circulating around in there. Now, a real important test tip here, so write this down. Diarrhea and fistulas cause large fluid losses. All right, guys, next is our fluid loss through skin, also called sensible losses or sensible perspirations. This refers to visible water and electrolyte losses through skin, known as sweating, or even diaphoresing, profuse sweating. The chief solutes in sweat is sodium chloride and potassium. Now, this particular loss increases during conditions like fever, heat stroke, or even hot patients during like thyroid crisis. Due to an increase in metabolism, you usually get really hot and sweaty. All right, now a little side note. For every degree that increases in body temperature, insensible water losses increase about 10%. So an increase in like eight degrees increases 80% of insensible losses. Now lastly, burns, which a lot of students forget about, but burn patients are the most at risk for fluid volume deficits because they lost a ton of water from the blister formation on their burned skin. Now finally, the lungs also causes insensible losses, usually at a rate of approximately 300 mLs per day. Now the loss only becomes very serious at an increased respiratory rate or even in dry climates. So monitor your patient with respiratory alkalosis, a big key word there. These patients usually have hyperventilation called Kuzmal respirations. That's a huge keyword that loves to show up on tests. Yeah, basically you end up panning like a dog and blowing off all that CO2, that carbon dioxide, I call carbon diacid. So panting like a dog, I call it respiratory <laughs> alkalosis because it's acid that is leaving the body via carbon dioxide, making your body this alkaline state. So guys, don't forget respiratory oh, 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 alkalosis, okay? Okay, now let's cover a few key terms for fluid physiology. Today we're talking about osmosis, diffusion, and filtration for the fluids in your body. Now let's go through some fancy medical definitions. Now diffusion is the movement of solutes from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration, leading ultimately to equalization of the solute concentrations. It occurs through random movement of ions and molecules. Now a great example of diffusion would be the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, also called CO2, inside the lungs between the pulmonary capillaries and the alveoli. Now, osmosis is kind of like the wet version of diffusion. So osmosis is the movement of fluid from an area of lower solute concentration to an area of higher solute concentration with eventual equalization of solute concentration. Basically, the whole goal of diffusion and osmosis is to balance and equal out the playing fields here. So we don't want any clumping or crowding. It's all about sharing here because sharing 
is carrying. Next term is filtration. Basically, the movement of water and solutes occur from an area of high hydrostatic pressure, key word here, to an area of low hydrostatic pressure. Now, the best example of this would be in the kidneys, basically the washing machines of the body that filter approximately 180 liters of plasma per day. Oh my gosh, that's like a ton of plasma. Oh my gosh, I know, right? Now, filtration is simply a passage of water and electrolytes through the arterial capillary bed in the interstitial fluid. It's all about fluid pressure, also called hydrostatic pressure, resulting from pumping action of the heart. All the way from the aorta down to the kidney washing machines directly, this pressure put on the kidneys helps the filtering process and helps the body wash out all the toxins and excess waste. But mainly they wash out HUC. Hydrogen ions, which are acidic, urea, also called BUN, a byproduct of protein metabolism, as well as creatinine, a byproduct of normal muscle function. But we'll get to that later in our kidney videos. Our next term is osmolality, which refers to the number of osmotically active particles per kilogram of water. It's simply the concentration of the solution, basically how heavy and concentrated is it. Looking to cut your study time in half? Head on over to simplenursing.com forward slash YouTube. You can sign up for free and get access to all of this.